Welcome to another discussion that we're having for the Flatten the Curve Summit. Um, we're now in the middle of uh, day two of uh, Flatten the Curve Summit. And uh, it's been really, really interesting. We've had wonderful perspectives. Uh, we've really dug into some uh, difficult issues. Uh, this discussion is going to really look, I think, at something that's at the heart of the matter. Uh, we're talking to Jay Beal. Now, Jay is an expert in security, cybersecurity, um, has presented at conferences for over two decades, Black Hat conferences, um, doing training for InfoSec, and is really an expert in that area. Uh, this talk is gonna be a little more personal and I'll let him uh, just kind of start. Hi, thanks a lot, Sean, I appreciate it. Yeah, I I wanted to speak here and and give a personal perspective on, on flattening the curve. Um, I wanted to appeal for us to keep doing it and um, and it is very personal for me. I'm not a, I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm not a medical doctor um, or any of those things. I am a lay person. And so, um, and so the personal appeal is in many ways the best one I have. Uh, but I think that you'll find the data that I'm bringing is data that is easy for you to find um, and confirm. Um, and, uh, and I'll bring you more than data. So where are we going? Uh, oh, first, this is my graphical bio instead of a written instead of a written one. Uh, instead of prose, I often like to do a graphical bio. I've written a bunch of I've written a bunch of books that are now getting pretty old. I have a daughter that you'll hear about um, in this talk, and uh, I've written some open source tools for lately for hacking Kubernetes, but a long time ago for uh, locking down Linux systems. And I give tons of talks on attack and defense in the information security space. Um, I'm also the CTO at Ingardians. Um, and uh, well, let's just get into it. This is what I wanna talk about today. So I've been concerned because in some states there's been talk and quite a bit of talk about ending social distancing. And it's a reasonable desire. The economic impact um, that it's having is real. Um, it's really concerning people and, um, and uh, either people are upset that they're having to social distance or they feel like they've done enough. Um, one of the thoughts that one of the thoughts that that comes to me is that uh, uh, some good number of people who are saying let's end the social distancing, you know, when they're when they're asked to measure that that sacrifice of human life, um, if we if we allow the if we allow this illness if we allow this pandemic to have much much higher numbers and to and to come on much faster and overwhelm the medical system, as they say, well. Um, maybe it's only the really old people who will die. Maybe the, those people are, you know, only a few years from dying anyway. And, um, you know, it, so, you know, they, they say it's, it's just the elderly. Um, what are you worried about? And we all know at this point that there are a couple things. The first is that the elderly get sick through the, through those, of, through those of us who contract it and, um, and don't die before we next visit them. Um, but, but beyond that, I want to consider what elderly means here. So um, I want to talk about who those elderly are. I want to talk about whether the elderly are truly the, the only ones who are, who are going to die um, if we don't keep flattening the curve. Um, I want to talk about whether social distancing is working and if it's necessary. So first, who are these elderly? I told you this would be personal. So this is, this is 2019. This is my grandmother. This is one of my grandmothers. Uh, meeting my daughter for the first time. And uh, I talked to her earlier tonight. We had a great conversation. Um, she's going to live a lot more in a year if uh, um, uh, I would expect. Um, uh, and my other, that grandmother's 92. This is my other grandmother and my aunt. Um, so the people in this, pic this picture, I'll let you guess the ages. Uh, the grandmother on the right might be 96. And then one of the other two people in the picture is 72 and the other one's two. Um, so um, these are, these are two of these pictures, two of the people in this would probably, would, uh, would certainly meet the elderly condition. Let's look at some more elderly. Well, there's me on the left. Um, I'm 44. Um, my mother in the middle is 69. My stepfather is 75. Um, so yeah, at least two of those three are have their AARP cards. 
this is my father with his two brothers. And uh, my father just is just about to turn 70 and his brother on, a, on, uh, on our right is 75 and his brother on, on, his, on our left, on his left is 60. So um, yeah, these are, these are the people, this is just kind of, if we all think about it, these are those family members of ours. And I'm sure there are people even outside of your family that, that are in those ages, that 65 and above, uh, where you were expecting you were going to get to you were going to get to see them for quite a bit longer, um, that they weren't just ready to they weren't just ready to pack it in and uh, and call it over, call it all over, um, you know. If you talk to anybody who's considering how long the social security fund you know will last and so on, you know one of the one of the laments they have is you know sixty five isn't what it used to be. Um, it used to be like the way life expectancies went. You know, you're sixty five, like it was kind of a um, it, your life was only going to be so much longer, and that's it's not the case. Sixty-five is, you know, sixty-five is still a time when people are can often be quite active. Um, but let's consider outside of that question of the elderly. Um, you know, are the are these are these elderly people the only ones who are really going to who are really going to die of COVID nineteen um, if they contract it? So I'm going to show you a good good amount of data. Um, if I, if you get a download of my slides later on, um, I'll add sources in the notes pages. Um, this is uh, this is just the New York City data. So on New York New York City data about uh, about a, a little more than a week ago, um, this is how the deaths broke down. What we see is that um, we had. Um, you know, you think, eh, don't worry about this for anybody, you know, for any, for anybody who's a kid, anybody under age 18. Well, three of those, you know, three people under age 18 in New York died. Um, uh, you know, I, I remember when I was talking to, uh, when I was talking to somebody who said, why are you worried about COVID-19? You're, you know, you're young and healthy. Um, well, I'm in that 18 to 44 age group, but just barely. And, uh, and we make up in New York, we make up 4.5% of the deaths, 309 of those people have died, you get into that 45 to 64, still below that AARP number, and you've got almost 1,600 people died in New York City. Um, that's 23% of the deaths so far. Um, so just in that first, just in that first age group, you've got almost 30% of the people who are dying are are under 65. This isn't just about the elderly. Um, if we add in that 65 to 74, that that set of people who uh, you very much expect they're, they're going to be around and collecting the social security checks and so on. Uh, they are making up 20, about almost 25% of the deaths right now. Um, and then the 75 years and up, that's they're uh, up near 50%, but under 50%. The other thing though is, is here to notice that we're looking at 6,800 people um, who died uh, and that's in New York City. Um, that's not worldwide. We're going to, we'll talk about that. So, you know, the thing that the thing you might have noticed in one of the earlier slides is that pre-existing conditions seem to have an effect on the mortality rate. Um, so, you know, we'll note these are these are the top five pre-existing conditions, but there are there are 10. And this is what death rate looks like. Um, so we've got if you have cardiovascular disease, um, then you, you know, then you have a 10 and a half to 13%, like it's called about a 10% chance of dying. If you have diabetes, you have at least a 7% chance of dying. Um, chronic respiratory disease and hypertension both come in about 6% uh, and cancer at 5.6. Um, but let's just, and let's look at that last line that no pre existing conditions. So if you don't have any kind of, if you don't have any kind of pre existing condition from that, from this list of 10 I'm going to show you later, um, your chances of dying are only about 1%. Um, so the difference, if you have cardiovascular disease, you're 10 times more likely. If you have diabetes, you're seven times more likely. If you have hypertension, uh, you're six times as more likely. So yeah, this isn't, and this is across ages. We'll, we'll talk about this. The, the Chinese data has also uh, borne this out. There was a study of 1,590 people who were infected with COVID-19. They looked at the death rate. Um, for the ones who didn't have a comorbidity, their, their mortality rate was 1.3%. For those who did, it was 8.8%, uh, you know, climbing up to that, climbing up close to that 10% number. 
well, okay, the next thought is maybe only old people have those illnesses. Maybe it's just about the elderly, right? Um, that doesn't seem to be borne out. Remember that first column? So three people, those three people uh, who died in that zero to 17 age group, they all had, they all had one of those underlying conditions, those 10 underlying conditions. Um, out of those, out of the 309, out of the uh, 309 people who were eight, under age 45, um, there were 244 who had underlying health conditions. There were 25, there are 25 that didn't and 40 that we're not sure about. But those underlying health conditions, they definitely hit other age groups. Now, okay, I said this would be personal. So let's make it personal. So first, I have asthma. This is, this is me, my mother, and my stepfather, right? So I have asthma. My mother has asthma. Actually don't know, but she, potential, uh, she also has hypertension. I'm remembering that now. Um, and I don't know what are other comorbidities because oddly, you often don't talk to your parents as much about, you know, about the uh, health, health complications that they've picked up. My stepfather has diabetes. Um, so, you know, this is just, this is just, you know, one part of my family. These are the two grandparents that my uh, daughter talks to um, every other day on FaceTime uh, prior to COVID-19. <laughs> and, um, and, um, and, and for me, the, the personal part, you know, one of the personal parts here is that my daughter's two years old. I really want her to remember these two people. I, I want her to remember all the people whose pictures I've shown you. But um, if they, uh, if they die prematurely, if they die really, if they die really soon, then she doesn't get to necessarily remember them. She'll have great pictures. Um, but this is, this is real for me. Um, the thing is, I, I just said, you know, you, our parents often don't tell us what, uh, what small or seemingly small issues they had, they have, um, you know, you're, uh, I think everyone I, you know, I, I, everyone I know who's got a, who has a parent uh, or who's around my age can say, oh yeah, their parent mentioned, oh yeah, I had a, I had a, you know, doctor was worried I had a heart thing. It was fine. Or it was a small heart thing. Um, so I, I just, I urge you to think about all the people that you know that are in those age groups or that aren't in those age groups and wonder, you know, do they have, do they have one of these 10 things? So what are those, what are those 10 things? Somehow I've only got nine on the slide. You'll, I hope you'll forgive me. Uh, diabetes, um, lung disease, cancer, immunodeficiency of any kind, heart disease, hypertension, asthma, kidney disease, GI liver disease. These are the folks who get to have a higher mortality rate than that 1%. Um, these are the, these are the folks that uh, that get to die when they're, you know, that, that have that higher probability of dying even when they're under 65. So maybe those things aren't all that common. Well, okay, here's uh, from the Di American Diabetes Association's website. Um, it says more than 10% of Americans have diabetes. Um, you might think, well, maybe that's, maybe that's just the oldest 10%. Um, sounds like the old, you know, cigarette smoking, you know, cigarette smoking uh, thing people used to say. They'd be like, oh, it takes 10 years off your life, but those are the bad years, right? So uh, it turns out that the Americans who have diabetes, that, you know, 34.2 million, 19.9 um, of those uh, U.S. diabetics are, 19.9 million of those U.S. diabetics are under age 65. So uh, no, this isn't just about old people. Um, heck, we also know that, you know, it's a smaller number, but one quarter of 1% of all the people in the U.S. who are under 20 um, have diabetes. Um, we know this is, we know diabetes is actually really common. So uh, you've got this more than 10% of the population and, and about 20 million out of, what, 328 million people in the U.S. Um, so uh, let's figure out those numbers about six, seven percent, um, about six, seven percent um, the population is, is under 65, has diabetes, and thus is six times more likely to die. Um, I told you I had asthma, and this is part of what makes this personal for me outside of my family. Um, uh, I also told you my mother has asthma. Um, and yeah, um, the CDC says one in 13 people have asthma, more than 25 million Americans. 7.7% um, of adults, 8.4% 8 of, of children. This is common. Um, how about hypertension? Clearly not that many people would have hypertension. Oh, wait. 
108 million of us in the US have hypertension. I don't actually. Um, uh, I'm fairly athletic despite having that asthma. Um, 108 million people, around 45% of adults in the US um, have hypertension and fit, and that maybe it may be very light hypertension. Um, but this is this is the difficulty um, in that these things that we these illnesses that have been pretty easy to live with um, that don't tend to have a, a huge impact on uh, on your life on, you know on on your odds of dying when you're in middle age or younger um, are now uh, now COVID nineteen makes them far more dangerous. Um, so I guess I'm the point I'm trying to make in that here is that. Um, it's not just the elderly. There are a lot of folks that have one of those co one of those comorbidities, one of those pre-existing conditions, and um, and are living with it fine, and probably maybe living with it so fine they don't really tell you about it. You don't know. You don't know who um, who out of the people that you care about, who out of the people you call friends, um, is at risk here. So let's talk about the social distancing. So I've kind of put you on a I put you on a little bit of a downer. I, the next, this, this last thing that I want to talk about isn't quite so much a downer, um, but I am trying to get us all to take it seriously because um, social distancing is, has been the most effective weapon that we've had so far. So first, you know, people are saying, wait a second, and this is something that's coming up. In Washington, we, you know, we spent, um, we sent a number of the ventilators that we'd gotten off because Washington's starting to, is, uh, things are turning around in Washington where we are having, our rate of new cases is slowing. We're getting new cases and deaths every day, but it's slowing. Um, so, you know, we start to see this is this, this is this kind of curve. Um, this is the logarithmic scale where um, you go from, you know, the first line's 10, the next line's 100, the next line's 1,000, you go up two more lines and you're at 100 thousandths. This isn't linear. And yeah, this shows that we're, you know, this shows that the slope, we're starting to flatten. Um, but I want to show you what this same graph is like on a linear scale. So on a linear scale, you see what looks a lot more like that scary kind of hockey stick growth, which when you're in the uh, when you're in the tech startup field is is what you're looking for in terms of your in terms of new customers. Um, that says you're you're being really successful. But when it comes to people dying, um, it's pretty awful. So um, that total coronavirus is this is for the world, not for the U.S. Um, is uh, it's still going up and it's going up and it's going up pretty fast. Um, here's another thing, here's another way of looking at it that, that kind of should give us pause and make us remember that there are a lot of people, um, there are a lot of people dying. Right now, each of these, uh, each of these bars um, represents the number of people who died on a, on a given day. So each bar is how many per day. So that means we've, our worst day was had more than seven and a half thousand deaths in the world. Um, the last few days, um, our numbers are somewhere between 5,000 and seven and a half thousand deaths. Um, wow, that's good. We're not at that, we're not at that seven and a half, we're not above, we're not above that seven and a half thousand number um, in daily deaths. Um, I have to make this, you know, a little more personal for me. I get a, I get a, uh, I'm, I live in Seattle, King County. I get King counties, you know, each day. This is how many more cases we have, and this is how many deaths, and and our numbers starting to get, uh, you know, start starts to get more encouraging. It's it's uh, it keeps dipping below ten. So it's you know, eight people, and you see, and you get encouraged, and you see nine people, and the next day you see it's twelve or fifteen. And you know the trends can the trends when even when the trends are heading down it can be encouraging and yet you're like wait those those eight people who died today like those were people um, and they had families and they had friends and um, and so it's real and we're having a we're having actually a better experience in Washington than other places so again personal my parents um, those parents I was showing you they live in Maryland um, and this is. This can either, you know, I so I go to check and see how their state is doing, and um, and Maryland, you know, Washington, we were kind of the first state that really was on the map for having this. Um, we may have been, you know, we may have been patients here in the U.S. Nobody can really know, um, but what's ha what's happened is in the days since we hit one 
uh, one death per million. Um, um, uh, we've got, you know, we're now, <laughs> we've slowed down enough that, that Maryland has overtaken us, even though, uh, while we're at that, you know, we're, when we're past 50 days since then, uh, Maryland's only, you know, 23 days past that, and yet their numbers are now worse than ours. Um, the, and the, on the one hand, that's discouraging for me, because Maryland, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's where I grew up and where I have my family, but it's also encouraging for me because Washington, you know, we, you know, our, our governor gives these uh, almost daily briefings and there are a pile of people who come on, you know, right on, who, who write on social media and say, wow, thank you. Thank you. Keep, keep doing it. And there are people who write on there and say, this is all, you know, social distancing is awful. You have to stop it. Um, so, you know, we're on the one hand, um, we're doing, we started, we started doing the social distancing in many ways earlier. Um, uh, our governor had a lot more resolve. Honestly, there were a number of us who were rooting for it to start before that, before he finally, before he made it, before he made it an order as opposed to a suggestion. Um, but, uh, but we, but we've been, uh, we've been doing pretty well. Um, and that social dis distancing is powerful. This is Washington versus Ohio. Um, it's not as discouraging, but uh, but you can see that Ohio has uh, that Ohio's not been doing as well as Washington either, and uh, and that's you know that's my part part of my concern. So let me try to let me try to move to a positive note. So the the point of those last two is to just say this works, and we have to do it, and we're not by far done. Um, uh, but this is this is our graph. If you um, uh, there are a couple websites that I'll that I'll uh, that I'll that I'll be referencing in the notes page of the slides, but this is this graph is showing a, a, it, the left side of the scale is a log is the logarithm of deaths per million. And what this what these dotted lines do is, if you look at the slope of these dotted lines, they're telling you the the uh, the speed. Um, the speed at which the death count is uh, is increasing, and um, and what you can see is that toward the beginning, um, in the first five days, uh, in the first five days, the U.S. was you know having the death count um, double every uh, double every two days. When I say the first five days, it's the first five days at the point where we passed uh, one death per million per million inhabitants, um, and um, and then as we go on, that, that slope changes. That slope changing is huge um, because you move to that next line, you know, you move something to, to something that emulates that next line of, you know, doubling every four days. And it's clear that we're headed toward that doubling every 12 days line. There are other countries on here that you can compare against. And the reason I chose this, um, the reason I chose this graph is we're a very populous country. And so if you want to see how we're doing, like on the one hand, we have the most deaths in the world, but we also have a very large population compared to most countries. Um, and so being able to make that comparison, you make the comparison in deaths per million. Um, and you can see which countries have done, have done really well and, um, and which countries aren't doing as well. And, and you can see how we've all improved over time. And that's the point. We have a tremendous amount of power if we can keep doing what we're doing, if we can keep doing the social distancing while we get testing online, while we get work on a vaccine moving, while we learn more and while we continue to build hospital capacity, like we have a tremendous amount of power, but that power requires resolve. And that's the point I'm trying to make. Um, so, you know, again, another, just another slide to, to say this green line here is uh, another, another slide to say that this is really important for us to get right. This green line is, um, is a five day moving average of how many new cases are confirmed per day. So that, you know, you're seeing that kind of bounce around that, you know, 25,000, 30,000 mark um, in the U.S. We're, um, yeah, we're finding so most of my slides have been focused on the number of deaths as opposed to the number of cases, because we don't really have the testing to know what number of cases truly is. Our best measure right now is to look at how many people died, um, make an estimate of the case fatality rate that's a little, you know, a little wild, and then say, well, two to four weeks ago, 
the number of cases would be indicated by the number of deaths we have today. Um, and that's the other hard part. Like that's the other hard part of the social distancing of, of us, at least when we were trying to get ourselves to start social distancing, the hard part was that we'd see the data and our data was all, our, our only reliable data was, was, uh, was deaths. And that was always trailing. Um, and that trails, you know, by weeks. Um, I mean, honestly, confirmed cases also trails unless you, you know, unless you could test 328 million people in the country all at once, which again, also not doable. So, um, so I guess this is my, this is my closing slide. And then, and then Sean and I are going to talk. Um, but to make this, to bring this back to the personal, I'd really like you to help me, um, to help me help my daughter get to remember her grandparents. I'd like her grandparents to still be alive in a year. And that's really important to me. And I'd like everybody else's grandparents to also have a good, also have a better, also have better odds. And beyond grandparents, honestly, I'd like all of us who are middle-aged to have better odds. And beyond the middle-aged folks, I'd like all the people who aren't yet middle-aged to also have better odds um, because this is real. Um, COVID-19 is real. It's, it's risk to people who aren't elderly is real. It's risk to people who are elderly is real. Um, but we've also found that we can have a pretty profound effect. And, uh, and if you remember what I was showing you, the difference between Washington and Maryland and Washington and Ohio, where my grandparents live, right? Um, that this is, we have quite a bit of, quite a bit of capability um, if we can keep doing what we need to do. And that's why I asked if uh, I might speak here. And uh, thank you, Sean. Thank you, uh, Jay. That was really, uh, really hard hitting. Um, <laughs> and I think something that, that all of us are feeling um, to a certain extent, right? Um, one of the reasons I was motivated to, uh, to put together this summit is because, um, you know, in my family, uh, we have two immunocompromised individuals. Um, sharing the same household, now can't go anywhere else, right? Uh -huh. um, and then also uh, my father is coming home to that household. Uh, he's a postal worker, so um, <laughs> he's essential, right? Um, yeah. And it, it's going to keep staying that way. So um, very scary stuff. So so thank you. Um, I what do you wish when I'm... What? If I could ask, what are you wishing that we would do for... Like, there are a lot of... The postal workers, and the grocery store workers, um, um, you know, all of those, all of those, all those retail operations that we need badly, like these people are essential. The power plant workers, so on. But, but those people who like literally are going and either walking up to a ton of houses every day, right. um, or um, or serving, you know, or serving a ton of people in the, you know, in the grocery store checkout line and so on every day. Like, what do you wish we were doing for them, if anything? Yeah. Um, so I do think that the best thing we could be doing is actually isolating them from, from the household. Um, you know, and uh, if we had a situation, for example, where um, university dorms were being opened up to those kinds of workers, um, I know yeah. in New Haven here, they have opened up university dorms and oh, hotels to uh, some emergency workers, right? Uh, and right. even people working in funeral homes and uh, places like that where they're going to obviously come into contact with, with a lot of uh, COVID. Um, but no one's thinking about the postal service, I'm sure. And uh, certainly, I don't think our society is anywhere near prepared to start uh, having a real honest discussion about, um, you know, like you said, grocery store workers or, or whatever. Um, and I think it's also really poignant. Um, a lot of the jobs that we tend to not consider in our normal situation, right? The pre-pandemic yeah. situation as being essential they really are um, in a very, very real way. Um, and those folks are not only obviously underpaid, that they're expected now to take a huge risk um, for yeah. them and their families. And it's really, really scary. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I'm, so I have asthma. I'm trying like all hell to, uh, to socially distance. Um, and, um, and so I haven't, you know, I haven't been to a grocery store in quite a while. Um, I'm getting my groceries delivered 
And, you know, there, there are all kinds of debates about like, how do we protect ourselves from, you know, if, if the grocery, you know, if the, um, if the grocery store workers are sick or if the delivery people are sick and, you know, and what you're bringing up, what, what I feel like you're bringing up really well here is, well, well, how do we care for those people if they get sick and how do we try to prevent them from being sick and how do we prevent them from, um, from infecting their families because they don't have anywhere near the same ability to socially distance. So um, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about contact tracing tomorrow, or actually a lot. <laughs> I'm really about excited tracing, about that. Which I know we're all thinking about as the you know, security privacy people and so on. Um, yeah. But uh, I think the dimension, which has not yet been talked about by anyone I've seen, and, and we're sort of hinging on it here, hedging on it, um, is that uh, discriminatory um, effect uh, where we sort of are turning people into non-human or a Absolutely. risk. So therefore, you know, and I don't know what's going to happen um, if we can do good contact tracing, you know, how that fallout is going to, um, and that's assuming that it works, et cetera, et cetera. But, sure. um, you know, what do you do? Do you just treat people like they're inhuman, <laughs> right? If they're uh, sick or if you're worried that they might be have a high probability of being sick, like right now, I mean, both of those are, I, I think that's a, you know, that, that's a really good, that's a really good point. It's a really good thing to think about. I mean, there's a, you know, there's a part of me that says, um, so, so uh, whether you like him or not, and I'm going to try so hard to not share my opinion of anyone in office, um, uh, but whether you like uh, Donald Trump or not, he did, uh, he did try out the rhetoric that he's a wartime president. And, um, and toward that end, we've used the, we've used the defense, I've forgotten the, the name of the act now for defense production act, something like that. Yeah. Um, and in the same way, you know, I, I think about, you know, I think about um, the kind of messaging we had in World War II, like what we said to each other, you know, what our government said to us, sure. And then, and then that conversation we had with each other about, um, about what our part was in a war. You know, our part was to conserve, you know, our part was, was to conserve materials um, uh, to suffer through some, through some rationing or what have you, knowing that that was going to provide the war effort. And in my way, you know, in my mind, without even really asking for sacrifice, like we could start having that conversation about those essential workers, about the essential workers who aren't medical. Um, about the people who are making sure that we all still get food, about the people who are making sure that we that we get our mail, that we get our you know that we get all those things that are that we're that we're able to order and have delivered, so that we don't have to leave, so that we keep everybody safer, you know the like literally the the uh, you know the the empl the uh, delivery service employees, whether they're for whether they're working for Amazon, uh, the postal service, um, um, UPS or what have you, they're they're honestly, in my mind, like, I'd like for us to consider them our soldiers. Um, I'd like for us to, to thank them. Like, I'd like for, you know, like, you see your postal, you, you see your postal worker? Um, this is something I've started doing. If I see my postal worker, if I see somebody delivering Amazon packages, even if they're not delivering to me, I just thank them. Um, I thank them for it. And, you know, and that's the first, and that that's that first measure for me is just to remember that these people are taking more risk and they're doing me a favor. Um, you know, if I could, if I could, um, if I could make money appear, um, if I could make money gather, um, if I had, you know, if I had government power, if I had, you know, nonprofit or whatever, I, I think one of the things I'd want to do would be to start a, you know, would be to, would be to, start a fund um, to give any, any of them that doesn't have health insurance, you know, pretty immediate, uh, pretty immediate access to healthcare while they're doing this for us. Um, you know, I, and that's, 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 for, and, and I believe we should be doing that for them before they're infected because the part that I didn't share when I looked at those, when I looked at all those numbers was um, when you look at, uh, there's something buried on one of my, on one of my slides, when you look at who dies from asthma, um, you're far more likely to die from asthma if you're an African American, and um, and it's because in our economic system they you know uh, they're they're medically underserved. Um, but 
you know, those same kinds of those same kind of things that, you know, the people who are in a number of those professions won't have either the same access to either the same insurance, or if they have insurance, the same ability to pay their co-pays um, or to, you know, or to do the things that are required to have really, really good health. And yet having better health before you contract this thing seems to have um, a huge impact on on your, you know, on your success rate of survival. And so like, we should be taking those delivery workers, we should be taking those grocery store workers, all of them and giving them the best shot we can. We should be, you know, like there, we should be giving them the equivalent of, you know, of really good body armor and training for, for our troops. Um, and, and I think, I think we're going to have those kinds of conversations. I hope, um, especially now the environment we're in, I, I, the, the healthcare here, um, I think we're going to look at it in a way um, where it's much more malleable what we can actually achieve. Um, sure. Especially seeing where the money's actually going, <laughs> which is not to giving healthcare to people and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, that's a good point. You see the trillions of dollars going, you know, all kinds of places, but not to the things that are essential or seem to be essential at this time. Well, and I think one of the, you know, I mean, one of the, one of the things that this has made me think about um, is that, um, you know, if, if, it, if we have a whole lot of people who are uninsured, um, if we have a whole lot of people with less access to healthcare, and those people can get sick and make the people that do have access to health care ill, um, then maybe even from the completely greedy and self-centered perspective, we should actually do a better job of getting everyone health care. It's, it's the, um, this is, you know, this is that, uh, this is one of those times where it becomes really, really obvious that there's a selfish reason to take care of, to take care of people's health. Yeah, Absolutely. So sort of um, on that page and, and something that I was thinking about um, when watching your presentation and just in general has been stewing in my head is um, the comparison between this and you brought up the cigarettes thing, for example, um, and uh, other crises that, that humans face. So with climate change, uh, one of the sure. things that uh, Bill McKibben says, who's a big a climate activist and writer in, on climate change, um, he says, you know, everybody's always trying to push things off to their grandchildren. And then, you know, 10 years go by and they're still saying, well, they're grandchildren, right? Um, right? And generations will change. And, you know, there's sort of this mental passing of the buck to the next generation. Um, yeah. In this case, it's almost the reverse, right? Well, you know, people are kind of saying, well, it's not going to be me because it's going to be only the elderly or only this group of people. Sure. Um, so I don't know if you had any thoughts on that or. Um, I think I'm trying to, yeah, so it's a reverse, pa are we talking about COVID-19 here or the environment? So if we're talking about COVID-19, um, it is interesting. I think I saw some memes on Twitter for a little while where it was talking about like, uh, one part was Generation X kind of patting themselves in the back and saying that they were, and I'm part of Generation X, but, uh, Generation X, the a Generation X author patting our generation on the back and saying, this is a really odd experience because in the early days of social distancing, we're trying to convince our parents to stay home. Um, and we're trying to, you know, and we're trying to convince the, the people who uh, perceive themselves and, and likely are at much lower risk in their twenties to stay home. And, uh, and so it's this kind of, um, it was even this strange, um, it, it, it even becomes this strange hump, but I'm not sure if I'm going on the direction you're, the direction you were kind of asking me about, but it's, um, but uh, part of what I heard there is that um, that this is one of those odd positions where you find yourself, um, where you find yourself trying to, where you find yourself um, trying to, trying to protect other people, trying to protect other generations rather than push it off to the to future generations. Is that kind of where you're going? Yeah, I mean, I was just thinking generally, I think one of the ways that people seem to cope with crises is kind of passing 
um, the bug oh, sure. that's trying to create this otherness. Um, yeah. You know, not going to be yeah. me, going to be this generation. Um, yeah. We're the generation that's actually being responsible. This one isn't, and so on and yeah. so forth. Absolutely. Well, and that otherness, in my mind, that otherness is what is what bites us in the butt. And it bites us in the butt, not just across generations. So first, that otherness that like, you know, that's kind of where I was trying to go with the presentation was, listen, this isn't just about the elderly. So stop just saying it's the elderly or if it is about or if, even if it was only about the elderly. There are a lot of people you probably care about who are elderly, who are elderly by our definition of elderly, by our current, you know, over 64 um, definition of elderly. But there's, um, um, where was I going? Um, but there's, there's, um, there's more to it with that otherness thing. Um, the other, you know, like for a little while, like we were having huge debates at the beginning about whether we should do the social distancing, about whether we should consider protections, about, about hell, about whether people should consider wearing masks. And, um, and those debates were, you know, were, were uh in the beginning they were very um they were very polarizing and a little for a little while they were polarizing on on political lines um uh potentially because the you know potentially because um the some of the um some of the fox news anchors and so on were were initially painting covid19 in the u.s as a hoax um and so some of that stuck around um, and some of that honestly still sticks around now. I think it's part of the reason we're having protests. Um, but that on the politics side, you know, we often, we, we so very much think about, about, uh, about people who don't believe what we believe as others. Um, and even more so because they have different news than we do. Um, and, um, and here's what's poignant for me. Here's what's personal for me. I, you know, like, there's this kind of almost schadenfreude that comes up and you go through it a little bit and then you feel awful, you know, like, so you're like, okay, the UK prime minister is saying, you know, saying COVID-19 is nothing to worry about. And wow, we just went to the hospital and now he's in the ICU, you know, and there's a part like goes, well, serves him right. Now he'll know we're right. Right. And then you're like, oh my God, that's a person, right? Like I'm, I'm celebrating the, you know, like, for just a second, I was I was celebrating that somebody through getting ill and potentially dying would know would know that I won an argument or my side was right and and that um, and I feel like that is that's the, that's another that's another part of it's another that's another part of the challenge that we're sometimes talking about sometimes not talking about you know I saw another one on social media yesterday where it was like this person who had posted on social media, these, um, you know, this is a hoax, you know, fight me or convince me that you're convinced me that I'm wrong. And I forgot what the other one was, um, you know, and he just died. And, um, and, and you could almost go through that same, like, well, you know, he was wrong. And then you're like, and you're reading, and it's like his wife and his children, um, you know, talk about what kind of person he was. And you're like, oh my God, that's, you know, that person who was on a topic of debate, um, even a topic of debate whose, you know, whose outcome, where the outcome of the debate will, will define how many people live and die, um, that person died. And that was a person, that was a human, and we value life. It's um, really important not to lose sight of that sort of yeah. humanity in all of this, right? Um, Hell yeah. I do think that the more that we're isolated, we're going to start seeing, um, you know, it's easy to get cold and distant when you're literally distant, too. Yeah. Um, one thing I just want to uh, ask you, and I, I think is just important for the end here, and then if you have something you want to ask me. Sure, no, no. Great too. Yeah. Um, but... Uh, you you had the numbers there for the death rates, right, and the infection rates and so on, but um, not so much the infection rates. Um, and I assume that's because the testing situation is not so great here. Or? That's that's exactly where I was when I looked. So there's a ton of great data you could see the Johns Hopkins um, University website and and Worldometer and so on, and you can find the data. And um, but I think that. Um, especially in the U.S., potentially in the world, but especially in the U.S., we're very cognizant of the, of the fact that we don't know um, because we don't have enough tests, because we don't have 
Um, we don't have a lot of coordinated testing. We don't even have, you know, that's, that's even before contact tracing. Um, we don't really know what our case count is. I mean, even as testing is ramped up, we still save, you know, we still, by ne I guess by necessity, save testing for a subset of people because we can't test the entire population of a state. Um, uh, you'd want that point in time, right? You want a point in time check of everybody, boom, you know, done. Um, and we don't have enough tests for that and we don't have enough lab capacity for it. Um, and, you know, our Washington state, we've, you know, our, our governor actually just wrote a, a letter to the White House um, a day or two ago saying, listen, you've, you've mentioned that, uh, you've mentioned that there, are, that there are plenty of labs, but, but I can tell you those labs don't have enough, that we don't have enough test kits, we don't have enough reagents, we don't have enough supplies, um, we need more, you know, we need, we need more group action. Um, to make that happen. So I posted, I, I gave you numbers about deaths because it's the only thing that we're quite sure about. We, and, and, and when I say we're quite, we're fairly, you know, we're quite sure I should be say, I should say fairly sure because the numbers, this is changing every day. And there was a point at which we started saying, okay, are the deaths, um, are the deaths that appear to have been COVID-19 like, but the person wasn't tested, but you know, every doctor in the, you know, every doctor in the room says that was COVID-19, which way do you count it? Um, you know, do you, do you fail to count it at all or do you count it, but in a separate column? Um, so, yeah. So anyway, the deaths are the best thing that we have and all the deaths can tell us is that, um, is that is where the case count was say, you know, two to four weeks ago. And I say two to four weeks ago as a non, as a, as a lay person, right. I, um, but it's, it, it appears that, if you contract this thing, um, you go through a period, you know, you go through a period of something like five to seven days where it's not that big a deal. You don't even, sometimes you don't even realize that your, own, that your symptoms are that, are COVID-19, arguably you might not have symptoms. I don't know about that. Um, and then you go into the, you know, and then you go into that position where if you're going to get very sick, you know, you head for the hospital, then the ICU, then the ventilator, then you either die or don't. Um, and for the ones who died, we can say, okay, we now know that four weeks ago you had this. <laughs> so that's our, that's, I mean, I'm laughing. I'm not laughing because it's funny. I'm laughing because it's uncomfortable sure. um, to say that's our state. Um, but that's also, so this is, this is key for me. That's also why we have to flatten the curve, right? We have to isolate to give ourselves time to learn everything, to learn like, well, if we only had deaths as a measure, what's the case fatality rate so that we can do that math? Um, we have to give ourselves the time to get all those reagents, to do the manufacturing, to get enough PPE for, um, for all of the kinds of medical personnel out there. Um, not just the ones in hospitals, but the ones in, the ones in nursing homes. We have to give ourselves time to work on a vaccine. We have to give ourselves time to, um, to, to come to the hard decisions um, about how about um, about how long uh, we're going to socially isolate and how many tests we're going to do, how frequently we're going to do it. Um, for us, honestly, to come to I, what I expect tomorrow in our conference when we talk about contact tracing, uh, I'm sure that's going to be a hell of a debate. I mean, I I know that you're a you know that that you're you feel very strongly about Tor and about privacy through what you're saying about Tor. Um, and, you know, part of the debate will be, can we agree that they're, you know, can we agree? I've seen, I've seen a paper on how to do contact tracing where we've got, where we have, where I believe we've got privacy. But when I was reading it, you know, uh, Moxie Marlin Spike, the creator of Signal, didn't quite agree that that first proposal was strong enough. I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth. So there's a, there's debates about how we can get the privacy to be strong enough. And, um, and that's that's going to be really interesting tomorrow to talk about. Yeah, no, I, I uh, we'll see how much I can cover because uh, yeah. there's so much to explain. I think sure, uh, just to kind of get the the technical sort of groundwork done. Not to set the bar too high. <laughs> well, I, I think that's a good good place to end actually yeah. because you know it's a good reminder. Uh, you gave us how important it is to flatten the curve, right, uh, and to sort of keep you know, having um, that sort of resolve to keep doing what we're doing. Um, and uh, you teased a little bit of what we're going to do tomorrow. So that's great. 
So uh, thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Sean. I hope next time I'm talking about uh, information security instead of uh, instead of health. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this is what there this is what there's to talk about right now. Um, this is what's important thank for you. us all to talk about and think about and sit with, and then uh, and then talk to everyone we know and keep the conversation, keep that national conversation, keep that world conversation on, you know, how do we how do we stay safe? <laughs>